everybody, my name is Julia Phillips. I'm a haematologist and I work in the Waikato, so this is why you're seeing me on video today. So today's talk is an introduction to the haematological malignancies. It's an overview. I'm going to talk to you about three concepts. Then I'm going to talk about how these conditions present and how you will see them present when you are doctors. I'll also talk a little bit about the diagnostic process that we go through. And finally, I'm going to give you a little roadmap on the rest of the course on haematological malignancies and some learning objectives for you to focus on. So the first concept I'd like to talk about is lineage. And the diagram here is a diagram of normal blood cell production. And it's really helpful to spend a bit of time on this because it does help us understand abnormal blood cell production. So at the top we've got a multipotent haemopoietic stem cell which is capable of re reproducing itself but also under the appropriate stimuli within the bone marrow of differentiating into either a myeloid progenitor cell or a lymphoid progenitor cell. The myeloid progenitor cell is then capable of differentiating further to produce the blood cells that the myeloid blood cells that we normally see in the peripheral blood, so that's the platelets, the red blood cells, the granulocytes, the mast cells, and the monocytes. And the lymphoid precursor cell is capable of differentiating into a natural killer cell, B lymphocytes, and T lymphocytes. So when we come to look at the hematological malignancies, we can correlate them with their normal counterpart. So we have a group of malignancies that we refer to as myeloid lineage malignancies, and they, cause, they arise from an abnormal myeloid progenitor cell. Then we have the lymphoid malignancies arising from the abnormal lymphoid progenitor cell. And the, there's a small group of hematological malignancies referred to as histiocytic tumors, which correlate to the tissue version of the monocytes but we're not going to spend a lot of time on them because it's relatively small print. The second concept I'd like to talk to you about is clonality, uh, because the haematological malignancies are all acquired and clonal disorders. So you probably know what a clone is, but for just to make things clear and to remind everybody that might have forgotten, a clone is a group of cells that is descended from and genetically identical to a single progenitor. And clonality is not abnormal in the sense that our normal blood forming process produces clones of normal cells. It's just that these clones are very small and there are huge numbers of them, so it doesn't look like there's a predominance of any one clone. But when we look at the malignancies, we see an expansion of a clone and we see that it is abnormal. I should also say that you can sometimes get small expansions of normal clones, particularly lymphocyte clones in response to infection. So the hallmark of the haematological malignancies is that there is clonal expansion of an abnormal cell. So this is the third concept behind haematological malignancies. And what I want to convey here is that for all of them, we've got an abnormal clone that is expanding and has escaped the, the body's normal control mechanisms for controlling numbers of individual cells. And because it's expanding and it's a haematological malignancy, what we find is an accumulation of the abnormal cells in bone marrow, in blood, in lymph nodes, in the spleen, and liver. But sometimes, because these cells are abnormal, they also accumulate in other tissues. When we see an accumulation of the abnormal cells in the bone marrow, that often interferes with the production of the normal blood cells. So we, alongside the expansion of the abnormal cells, we often see a reduction in the normal cells. So we've dealt with three concepts underlying the pathogenesis of the haematological malignancies. 
And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about how patients with these conditions might present to you when you are practicing doctors. So some of the features that you might see that might make you start to think, is it possible that this patient has a hematological malignancy, might be in large lymph nodes. They may have a big spleen. They may or may not have a large liver. They may be showing signs of bone marrow failure. So if they're anemic, they may be pale. If they've got low platelets, they may be showing signs of platelet type bleeding. So bruising, petechiae. And if they have low neutrophils, they may be suffering repeated or severe infections, particularly bacterial infections. Now, not every patient with a hematological malignancy is going to show all of these features. And the features will vary between conditions and even between individual patients with the same condition. And on top of that, this isn't an exclusive list. Tumors haven't read the textbooks. They can involve, they can do anything. So it, just because the patient hasn't got a classic presentation doesn't mean they haven't got a hematological malignancy. But what I'm trying to do here is give you a flavor of what the typical presentations might be. If you have a patient that you think might have a hematological malignancy, probably the next thing to do is to have a look at their full blood count. And different conditions will present differently, but here is one just as an example. So here we have a patient who has a low hemoglobin, they have a low neutral count, they've got a low platelet count, so they've got evidence of pancytopenia, but they do also have a very high white cell count, a very high white cell count. And on the bottom here, there are some cells in the peripheral blood that should not be there. Some blasts, which are primitive cells that should be in the bone marrow and not in the blood, and certainly not in this amount. And this, this is a presentation of acute leukemia. I'm not telling you this because you have to know how to diagnose acute leukemia. That's a diagnosis that is generally made in the laboratory and communicated to you. But just as an example of how these conditions can affect the blood count. So what we've got here are features of bone marrow failure and features of an accumulating abnormal clone, which is now manifest in the peripheral blood. So often the next stage in the diagnosis is the laboratory looking at blood or bone marrow or lymph node tissue, sometimes other tissues, but those are the usual ones for hematological malignancy, and interpreting what we see. So unless you become a laboratory hematologist or pathologist, this is not going to be what you have to do, but what I want you to know is that this is what's going on behind the scenes. So the pictures here just for illustration, the top one is a normal peripheral blood film, so there are normal red cells and normal white cells. And the picture at the bottom is a lymph node, which is actually a reactive lymph node, not a malignant one. So one of the other things that we do in the laboratory is we look at the, the antigens presenting on the cell surface, because this gives us information primarily on lineage. Remember we said that most hematological malignancies are either myeloid or lymphoid. So we'll get information on whether the malignancy we're looking at is myeloid or lymphoid. It will also give us information on what the stage of maturity of that malignancy is. Is it a very early cell, as we see in acute leukemia, or is it a more mature cell that we might see in a chronic leukemia? And Obviously, cells express multiple antigens on their surface, so we might be looking at multiple antigen detections. We can do this, we generally do this using manufactured antibodies directed against a specific antigen, and then using some kind of detection mechanism to highlight when that antibody has stuck to a cell surface.
And we don't really have time to go into the details of the techniques, but the usual techniques are flow cytometry and immunocytochemistry. And we, we will be showing you some examples of the results during the, the rest of this course. But the purpose of this slide is to let you know that we, uh, once we have done, you have done your clinical assessment, we've looked at the blood count, we've looked at the blood, bone marrow, lymph node, tissues, that one of the next things we do is determine what the antigen expression on the surface of the abnormal cells is. Okay, the next thing that really commonly happens when we're diagnosing hematological malignancies is we look at a carrier type, or at least the cytogenetics laboratory looks at the carrier type for us. So these are preparations of chromosomes that have been stimulated in the laboratory and then photographed and the photographs are arranged so, so that we can see what each chromosome looks like. And as you can see, they're arranged in pairs and if it's a male, obviously, it'll be XY and a female will have two Xs. So the top picture here is a normal carrier type and it's a man. Underneath is an example of an abnormal carrier type and it's one of the classic ones. It's what we see in chronic myeloid leukemia. It's a, a not, what we refer to as a 922 translocation. So there's been a swap of genetic material between one chromosome 9 and one chromosome 22. So if you look at the picture, there's one rather long chromosome 9 and one rather short chromosome 22. And it just so happens that the way those bits of, cr of chromosome get switched, it creates an oncogene that then causes the disease. So sometimes this is really, really helpful as a diagnostic tool to tell us which disease we're dealing with. And oftentimes it's also helpful in telling us, is this an aggressive form of this disease or a less aggressive one? Or is it, a, is it one that's going to do well or not going to do well? So prognostic information. So increasingly when we're looking at diagnosis of hematological malignancy, we're using techniques that actually look down at the gene level. So in the last slide we were looking at karyotype, looking at chromosomes, but this time we're looking at the actual gene. And more and more we're using molecular techniques both for diagnostic information and for prognostic information. And the common techniques are FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization, which this is a picture of, and polymerase chain reaction, which we use to amplify an abnormal gene. So in this, we're not going to go into the details of the techniques here, although it would be good for you to understand them and maybe that's something you could do in further reading. But just this picture here shows us an example of the BCR ABLE oncogene that is produced in the 922 translocation that we saw in the previous slide on the carrier type. So we've got a green labelled probe and a red labelled probe. And these probes should be separate when we're looking at DNA preparations. But what we're seeing here is that there is a green and a red probe together, which tells us that the BCR and the ABLE are together, and we've got a BCR ABLE gene that is the hallmark of chronic myeloid leukemia. Having done all of these assessments, the clinical assessment, we've looked at the blood tests, we've done the morphology, we've done any immunophenotyping, any cytogenetics, molecular studies that we feel we need to do, what we do then, of course, is put it all together to make a diagnosis and also use that information to decide what the likely outcome for that patient is, the prognosis. Okay, so this is the roadmap that I promised you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to give you an overview of where we're headed with the rest of the lectures in this malignant hematology series. And these are the groups of disorders that I think we need to talk to you about. These groups of disorders do cover the range of hematological malignancies. There are very many different individual diseases. So we're going to be talking to you about the most important and the most common.
And if you become haematologists or pathologists, then it will be important for you to know the, the detail of the subclassifications. But in this course, we're trying to give you the bare bones, the important things, the things that you need to look out for as a general, generally practicing doctor. You'll notice that the circles do overlap and that's deliberate because there are overlap conditions. There are conditions that don't exactly fit into say myelodysplasia or myeloproliferative disorders and they would be labelled as myeloproliferative stroke myelodysplastic. And similarly, some of the leukemias are really essentially the same as some of the lymphomas. So there's an overlap there. But this, this is just to give you a, a foretaste of what's coming with the rest of this particular part of the course, so that you know where you're up to. And finally, this is a list of your learning objectives to bear in mind as we go through the course. So we want you to understand how the haematological malignancies arise, at least as much as we do, which sometimes isn't very much. We would like you to be able to recognise the clinical presentations when you see them on the wards or in your practice. And also, importantly, we would like you to be able to understand enough about these conditions to explain them to your patients when you become doctors. Even if you're not going to be a haematologist, you are going to see people with these conditions and it will be important that you know how to talk to your patients about them. So that concludes this introduction. I'd like to thank you for your attention and wish you good luck with the rest of the course.